All right, everyone, let's, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you that, uh, that you have given us salvation, that, uh, that our sins have been, been forgiven, and we look forward to the uh, time that we spend here on earth, of course, with you, Father, but especially the time that we'll spend in eternity with you. Uh, be with us as we, as we look at these things in Colossians today. Uh, be with me, Father, that I would remember my studying and and, uh, and, and be with us so that the discussions that we have uh, would be the purpose of, uh, of, improving, of our improving as saints, of bearing fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so, so we're in Colossians this morning, and, uh, and we've been just studying or reading this this week. If you're visiting with us, we are, as a congregation, reading through the Bible. And, and we're actually reading daily reading Monday through Friday. Uh, we're just this year we're going Romans through Revelation, and so we're going quickly. And uh, each class is really lightning speed. Uh, two weeks on Colossians. So uh, at Romans, I think we actually had eight weeks. Uh, but aren't you supposed to go years on Romans? Uh, eight weeks. There wasn't a whole lot that happened. Uh, it was it was mostly just topical studies. Um, thinking about the, the book of, or the letter uh, to the Colossians, a uh, letter from Paul, what, what do you think of, just right off the bat, what's your impression of Colossians? Whether you've read it or not, what do you think of when you think of Colossians? Encouragement. What's that? Encouragement. Okay, a lot of encouragement in there. Okay, anybody else, any other thoughts? Okay, okay. Reconciliation. Okay. They are Gentiles, aren't they? Um, many of them are Gentiles, probably most of them. And it impressed me that they knew what he was talking about when he said, He rescued us from the domain of darkness. Okay. Okay, good. Here's, here's what I think of. I, I asked Debbie yesterday, my wife. Um, I asked her, what do you think of when you think of Colossians? And her answer was Ephesians, <laughs> and, which is exactly what I think a lot of times, that Colossians is almost, to me, and maybe you don't feel this way, but Colossians is almost this book that's kind of over there, that we, we look at a lot of particular books in the, in the New Testament, Paul's letters and all, and Ephesians, we spend a lot of time in Ephesians looking at the wording there and how things are described in Ephesians, but, but Colossians is just kind of in the background. Does anybody else kind of see it that way, or do you spend time there? Or? It's, it's a, Paul, Paul's getting repetitively redundant, and he's saying it over and over again for emphasis. You know, so he's, the, the message hasn't changed. It doesn't matter where he goes or who he's writing to, you know, so... There's, there's a certain amount of hope in that, that is like, oh, this, there's not a moving target here. You know, Paul lets, strives to let his yes be yes and his no be no, okay. you know, and th this is what it is. Good, okay, good. When you think of, of Colossians, I think my, my description of Colossians a lot of times is it, it is Ephesians in other words. And, and so typically, we, we use Colossians to explain Ephesians, and we use Ephesians to ex ex explain Colossians. They were both written about the same time, and they were both sent out about the same time. Uh, Tychicus was, was evidently the brother that delivered both of those letters, uh, delivered uh, to uh, Ephesus, delivered also to, uh, to Colossae. Um, uh, it's also, it's a companion book with another letter in the New Testament. What, what is that one? Philemon. Okay, when we see Philemon also, Philemon was one of the brothers in Colossae. And so, so that particular letter was also sent out at the same time, likely delivered also by Tychicus. And, uh, and, and the two go along together. You can make comparisons con concerning uh, particular individuals in both of those letters and, and kind of get a, a more complete idea of each one of those particular people. Uh, they were, it, it's, a, it's a prison epistle. Boots? Same need in 
Right. Good. And, and we do see that toward the end of this, toward the end of Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter 4. Um, let's see, where is it? Um, Colossians chapter 4, at, at verse 16. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So there was kind of a circuit thing going around. Um, I, I, I think I've mentioned this before. The letter to the Ephesians is thought to possibly be a circuit letter also. Uh, there's a thought that it's actually the copy that we have is actually the letter to the Laodiceans. And uh, that it was, that it was I, my understanding is, is they would take a, a letter like this to the Colossians and then they would change the beginning of it uh, to the Laodiceans or to the Ephesians. And it's thought that, that, that the one that we have where it says to the Ephesians may have even been originally sent to Laodicea and that now we have the copy that, that Ephesus uh, received, which I think is kind of interesting that, that all of those letters were passed, were passed around. So pinpointing the date, it's one of the prison epistles. Uh, like I mentioned, Paul is in Rome in prison. Uh, the first time he was in prison in Rome, it was between 60 and 62 um, AD. The Colossian church uh, would have received it during that time. I think something that's kind of interesting about Colossae is that between 60 and 62, the city of Colossae was destroyed. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that sort of thing? There was, a, there was an earthquake that destroyed the city. It destroyed the city of Laodicea. And I'm not sure, probably Hierapolis is also in there. Uh, but, but the, the uh, Rome rebuilt Laodicea, but the people of uh, Colossae rebuilt Colossae. And it was just never as great as it had been before. Colossae uh, comes up in history. Uh, they think at a way early time, even before Abraham, not under that name, but as a city, and uh, that it, it had reached a certain greatness under Rome, uh, but then Rome built Laodicea. Laodicea is about 10 miles from uh, Colossae, and with the greatness that was built into Laodicea, uh, the, the importance of Colossae diminished some. Uh, so by the time Paul uh, was there, by the time the church was established, it was considered still a great city, but not quite what it had been before. Joyce. Do you have any idea of how long after Revelation was written that Colossae was destroyed? Do you know that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's probably about 60 years after Revelation was written. Yeah. We don't know, I don't think we know much about Colossae at that time because as I mentioned, when was the destruction of Jerusalem? In 70, right? Uh, the city was, was originally destroyed in 62. So eight years before the destruction of, of Jerusalem. And, and it's thought that, the, uh, that Revelation was probably written around 90. And so it's quite possible that there was not a church in Colossae at the time that the seven uh, letters, to, that the letters to the seven churches of Asia was not in existence at that time. It's a possibility, but any other thought? Any, anybody else have any history of that area? It's kind of difficult to marry the history of the area and find out what all was going on at the time. I have a question. Sure. They did, yeah. Did the lines move that drastically to overcome the, Col the Colossians? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah. Like, if if they were part of that empire? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they were. They so were definitely. So that's why it was like non-existent at that time, or it it just wasn't rebuilt by Rome. And so once the city was destroyed in 62, it took the citizens themselves to rebuild that city. And the city, from what I understand, kind of existed until around 1100 AD, uh, where then the people of that city were moved to a, uh, to a city that's just kind of off uh, toward the mountains from there, a little bit from there. But 
but my understanding is from 62 on, it just wasn't a great city anymore. It wasn't important to Rome at that time. And so they didn't, Rome didn't rebuild it like they rebuilt Laodicea. So just the people, that was okay. Just the people, yep, just the people. Yeah, Let, let's look at a couple of maps just because I think that this is just kind of interesting stuff. Oh, this is not even on. So, so I kind of, I, I didn't know where, where Colossae was. I never bothered to even look it up, and that map is kind of hard to see, isn't it? Um, but, but Colossae is going to be, um, if you can see that, you can see, of course, the Aegean Sea, and you can see in red up there, Ephesus. Yeah. And you can see off just a few inches to the right, you can see Laodicea and Colossae up in there. Laodicea and Colossae are on a trade route that goes from Ephesus across uh, to supply off to the east there. And, uh, and it goes through a valley. Um, I think I've got a picture of how that, maybe, uh, that doesn't do it. Can you kind of see that? Yeah. yeah, we can see that one pretty good. You can see Ephesus over here. It's in, a, in kind of a bay area. And it goes off, and about 120 miles inland is Colossae. But you can see the, the trade route, the road that goes through, and uh, goes through Laodicea and then Colossae. And uh, one of the readings uh, that I looked at uh, said that, that the road eventually just kind of went by Colossae and wasn't even through it uh, anymore. Uh, but, but I kind of like this picture. Uh, it shows the three cities there together, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. Uh, one of the readings I looked at talked about how Colossae itself, uh, because of its situation, was supplied really well with a lot of cold water. But that Hierapolis, where it sits, actually has a lot of geothermal stuff going on, and so they had a lot of hot water. But Laodicea, where it sits, they had to take water in by an aqueduct, and by the time the water got to Laodicea, the water was lukewarm. It was not cold, and it was not hot by then. And so you can see, we think of that uh, from Revelation, that the problem with the church there is that they were lukewarm. And you can kind of see where, where John at that point, uh, where God through John is, is kind of a play on on words and their circumstance, because they would certainly know what lukewarm water was, right? And uh, how do we feel about a glass of lukewarm water on a 95 degree day? You know, it's, yeah, it's, you almost can't, can't stand drinking it, so. Um, but anyways, I thought that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good map. Is there another one on there? Oh, this one here, um, I, I put this on here just because I thought it was kind of interesting. When we think about the seven churches of Asia, uh, Joyce um, asked about, um, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and, uh, and like I said, we typically think of Revelation as being written 20 years, possibly after the destruction of Jerusalem, around 90. And, uh, and I think it's reasonable to believe that maybe the church in Colossae didn't exist or was somehow insignificant or just wasn't part of uh, what uh, the letters that God was wanting to put out uh, through John. But you can see in white all of the cities uh, that are in Revelation 2 and 3 and, uh, and how they kind of sit in there with Colossae. Uh, because Colossae was a church of Asia. Uh, it's considered to be in the Phrygia, Phrygia region, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's also one of the uh, churches, if there was a church in, in existence, they would have been one of the seven, or one of the churches of Asia, just not one that had been written to. But uh, I don't know, that's, that's kind of beyond, uh, way beyond uh, looking at the book uh, this morning. It's thought, by, it's, it's thought by most, I think, that the church was not founded by Paul. Uh, there's, there's some thought that maybe he was there, but there's, there's several passages that come out uh, in Colossians to think that, that Paul did not establish that. Um, it's thought that uh, this brother Epaphras was probably the one that, uh, that taught the gospel there. Look at Colossians 1 at verse 7. 
Um, we're right in the middle of a long sentence um, where he's talking about the Word of God, and then he says in verse 7, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And, and so it's thought that, that they had actually been originally taught by Epaphras. And there's, there's even thought that he may have started the church in Laodicea and Hierapolis also. They're all pretty close together, 10 to 13 miles apart from each other. Also at the beginning of, of chapter 2, it says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of the fullness, of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's uh, mystery, which is in Christ. Uh, more sentence after that, but, uh, but he's mentioning there that, uh, that, that all or, or many of them had not ever seen him face to face, which is just another possibility that, uh, that Paul did not establish this church. Um, it, it's thought that Epaphras may have come at, to Paul and given him some information and maybe he had even asked, please write to this church. Please write to them uh, because there are these things that are going on. In, uh, at, at, the end of the, at the end of the book, um, chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you along always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all of the will of God. This is the end of the book where he's saying, Epaphras is here with me. And Epaphras is struggling in prayer for all of you guys. And then interestingly, over in Philemon, uh, we find out maybe a little bit more about, about him. In Philemon, verse 23, it says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, in Christ Jesus sends greetings to you. And so it's thought that, that Epaphras for some reason was also then in prison with Paul. We don't know why, don't know more than this. Uh, we only have these three mentions, two in Colossians and the one here of Epaphras and, and how he might relate, uh, how, might ha how he might relate to the church. Right. Most likely that's why he is in there, <clears throat> to save his function. Um, because this is in the middle of where they're being persecuted for right. uh, their, their faith. So they are writing these letters and spreading the gospel and supporting each other due to that. Um, that time. Right. Because it's like anybody, like when you're here on my congregations in California. We gain strength from each congregation and encouragement from that to continue on sure. with our journey. So that's kind of what this is our example of that, too. Right. Is how to do that and continue to create that encouragement. Right. It, it, and, and Epaphras was likely in for that reason. Uh, it's just that we don't know all the details that led to that. You know, did they arrest him? Uh, closer to home and take him there? Did he go to see Paul and was then arrested? We just don't have any history. And, uh, and the way that Paul describes him, he sometimes describes himself, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and we might think, well, yeah, that could mean that he just uh, is, it is in some kind of servitude for Jesus Christ. But when he uses that language, he's generally saying, I'm in prison and it's because of, of my preaching of the gospel. And he, he describes Epaphras in exactly the same way. Anything else on Epaphras or any other thoughts anybody has concerning him? Philippians about Philemon. Did I say Philippians? No. No. Okay. It's Philemon verse 23. I had in my mind imagined that you were looking for chapter 23 in Philemon, but... Uh, there just aren't that many up there. Just guilty by association, whether it's good or bad. So. Right. Yeah, it, it's hard to say. But, but we tend to think that, that Epaphras was actually instrumental in starting the congregation there and uh, that he had given the news 
of, of a need that, Coloss that, that the uh, Church of Colossae had that Paul might be able to settle uh, via a letter. Um, I, just a couple of uh, maybe personal things toward Paul that, that I kind of wanted to think about for just a moment. Um, at the beginning of the, of the book here, we see Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, uh, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So we Tim see Timothy right off the bat, which is not uncommon with uh, a lot of these letters that Timothy is going to be associated with Paul, that he's, that he's with him somewhere. Uh, sometimes, uh, what, first and second Timothy, we see Paul actually writing Timothy letters concerning evangelizing, being an evangelist at, at uh, Ephesus especially. Uh, there. Also, Tychicus uh, that I've mentioned before comes up uh, in various places. Uh, we see him in Acts 20, uh, part of those that are carrying money for the relief in, uh, of the saints in Jerusalem. We see him associated with a guy named Trophimus, Tychicus and Trophimus, right? We see in, uh, in Acts 20 uh, sometimes. Uh, we see also in Ephesians 6, uh, we see him He's kind of one of those guys that I, I don't think of him often, uh, but he comes up at various times as a, as a helper of Paul. In Ephesians 6, uh, verses 21 and 22, he says, so that, you, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So you can see Tychicus as, as being a helper also. Um, those of you that know, uh, was Tychicus the only deliverer of the letter to, uh, to the church at Colossae? He had a partner. This guy's name was Onesimus. Do you know, who, who's Onesimus? Okay, he's a former slave. Um, there, you know, we don't lo know a lot of history about that also. And uh, it would just be kind of fascinating to know how Onesimus came to uh, become a Christian. But evidently he had escaped uh, from Philemon and had gone to Rome. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering if maybe he, he came to Paul by some association that although he escaped, maybe he looked for some that he knew. Because being a slave or a bondservant of Philemon, uh, it's likely that he knew the Christians there, and if there were other Christians down in the area, maybe he sought them out for some reason, and uh, it, it's just hard to know how that came to be. But fascinating to me that he does come up against Paul down there, and, uh, and he becomes a Christian, and not, you know, just baptized, but he's very important then for uh, for Paul down there. I want to kind of look at that for uh, just a second here. Uh, first of all, look in chapter 4 again, um, in verse, starting at verse 7. It says, uh, Tychicus will tell you about all my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Just like he had written to Ephesus, right? I'm sending Tychicus for these reasons. And then going on, it says, And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place. And so he's sending on Onesimus back with this letter also. But look over in uh, Philemon. I want to read just kind of this section of, of Philemon uh, concerning him. Uh, starting at verse 8, <clears throat> says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart I would, have, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he may serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be 
uh, by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and, and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. So, so we see that Onesimus, I think he's only mentioned in these couple of spots, uh, is also uh, just really important to Paul after he becomes a, a Christian. And he's one of the deliverers of the, uh, of the letter to the Colossians. I think it would be kind of fascinating to know if uh, Onesimus showed up at Philemon's house and handed him the letter to Paul, or from Paul. It would be interesting to uh, see that situation. Settle down, Philemon, please read this letter. But, uh, but anyways, he, he, gets, he gets that letter from, uh, from Paul. Uh, um, there's others that are mentioned there. Uh, I wrote down passages for them. We won't look at them, but, but Aristarchus is somebody that comes up. He's also a fellow prisoner. Uh, Mark, uh, who we all know, a cousin of Barnabas. Uh, he's there with Paul. Luke, of course, uh, we see him with Paul. And then also Demas, who is a faithful brother at this time, is, is with Paul when he writes the, this letter. So when we look at the uh, when we look at the letter to the Colossians, it's it, it's like nearly every other letter uh, that Paul sends out. Uh, we see the greeting, uh, the greeting just short in those two verses. Uh, they almost all mirror each other. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and pa and peace from God our Father. We almost see no variance uh, of those except for the re recipient when we look at the other letters. Now we get the letter, uh, or, or we get the greeting there, we get the body of the letter, and not uncommon with Paul either, uh, we see uh, what I call, uh, generally call the conceptual, um, or what, has, what God has done for us. And, and we see almost a perfectly even break uh, there. The first, chap first two chapters deal with this. The second two chapters in the body of the letter is how, how we are to respond uh, to, uh, to God's loving kindness, kindness to us. And, and so conceptual, the first two, uh, now what do we do? Uh, this, the uh, second, two, second two chapters. And then of course the farewell where we've read uh, some of the names uh, that I mentioned. Okay. Any thoughts before we kind of jump into this uh, first section quickly? Okay. All right. So, so like like Paul always does, and and probably we do the same sort of thing. If you have something that you need to take to your brother, how do you usually start? I have a bone to pick with you, right? <laughs> Because it warms them up to you and, and makes them feel good about you. Um, very often we commend them, right, in some way. Uh, we find something very positive. Uh, we even a lot of times do that in our own letter writing. We'll say something positive to begin with. And Paul generally does that. Uh, generally does that in his letters. He did not do that in Galatians when we went back, went through that earlier. Uh, you could see from the beginning that he was agitated uh, because of the situation in Galatia it, it, with those churches there. Uh, but here we see the same sort of thing. Uh, we see commendation. It, he starts out there, he says in verse 3, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word, uh, in the word of the truth, the gospel, and then a whole lot more sentence after that. 
but he, he, he commends them at the beginning. He says something very nice about, about them, although he's going to get into the situation that is, is causing a problem there uh, with the church. One of the things, uh, before we actually get to it a little bit later on, is it, it doesn't seem like there's something specific called out. When we went for, through 1 Corinthians, we saw many specifics that he was dealing with. Uh, but when we get a little bit later on in here, uh, in chapter 2, we find the possibility of four different problems that were coming together uh, in their belief system and what they were beginning to practice. And, uh, and we're kind of, it, it, and even there, uh, you know, looking through it, uh, reading what commentators have to say about it, uh, you can see that there's kind of a disagreement. We just don't know what the specific uh, problem for the most part was, except for the Judaizing things. The Judaizing things are pretty obvious. Uh, some of the other things are not, are not quite as obvious, but it wasn't just the uh, you have to be circumcised, you have to... Uh, uh, do the Sabbath, you have to do the festivals. Um, those were pretty, pretty evident in the church. But he starts this out you know, with the commendation, and then he goes into prayer. And it, this is something we, we, we also see in most of Paul's letters from verse nine. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Paul, Paul's praying for them. And, and I, I don't know, have you ever noticed that in, in, uh, in all of Paul's letters, for the most part, the amount of praying that he does? So I'm thinking that he's, he's so involved with all of these congregations especially the congregations that he started. He sees them as his children, and, uh, and he had to be a man in prayer a lot, all the time. If he wasn't out preaching at all, or, or, or maybe the times that he had to earn a living, uh, you could almost see him uh, uh, in prayer, uh, that, that he had a lot of people, a lot of congregations to, uh, to, pray, to pray about. spiritual side so it which is really a which is really a good point to think about because I, I think that it's something that we've kind of heard a lot the last couple of years you know well what's the term our thoughts and prayers our thoughts and prayers are with you does that necessarily mean that I'm going to pray for you my thoughts and prayers are, are with you uh, when we see it, it it's just kind of one of those sayings that people say to kind of kind of uh, smooth things over, make you feel better. Um, if you say that, my thoughts and prayers, how many of you sit down and pray about it? Some of you are really awesome. Um, isn't, don't you sometimes, maybe I'm, maybe I'm saying too much here. Don't you sometimes think, oh, I better quickly mention them in prayer. Just to say I prayed for them. And uh, it, I just don't see that in Paul. He, he's, he says these things and he embellishes what he has to say about praying for them. And, uh, and you can see him, uh, you know, really getting into prayer. It's not something in passing. It's not something quickly done. It's something he's doing because he knows that it will be in some way helpful to them. And, and that's probably something that we really especially need to remember now. Uh, that prayer is prayer is important. It also helps Paul, and it's an example for how to help us in the
And good. Then when we cut, you think about how somebody approaches you when if, if, if they do it with a kindness or with an aggressive attitude, which one are you more apt to listen to? And I think this is our example of is it not exactly those things. Good, good, yeah. It's, it, it is good to think that, that this would be something that could be settling to their minds, that, that he's commended them already and he's praying about them at the same time. And, and I, I guess, you know, if somebody's coming to me and they're telling me that, I'm thinking that there's a, there's a certain softening that can come, you know, knowing that, uh, that I have been really, truly in their thoughts and their prayers uh, toward God. Okay, good, good. Any other thoughts concerning that? I feel like that's weird, though. Like, if someone comes up and tells you, you were in my thoughts and in my prayers, like, that's just showing off and rubbing it in your face. Like, that's just weird. But if I don't tell you <laughs> that you've been in my thoughts and prayers, like, that is truly showing you that, I mean, I guess I, that's just not showing you anything. But God knows that I've been praying and thinking about you. You know what I mean? Like, well, I know, I know, know what you mean. Know that I've been praying for you. Yeah. Well, I think there's. <laughs> I, I don't want to say that. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's, that's well, and I think that sometimes people might receive it that way. It, and, and sometimes. I receive it that way. Don't tell me that you've been thinking about me and praying for me because that just feels weird. Well, now, now, well, let me ask you this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If it's somebody that you know. Say, say Debbie tells you that. Okay, Are you going to think different. that? <laughs> <laughs> she, she's different. Like what, what would happen with Zaylee like two years ago. And I told you guys, be normal. Don't say nothing. Act normal. Love me and hug me. But don't say, mm -hmm. pray for me. Be like, Healed, you know, a, lo like, a lot of, it. a like, lot of times it, it just has to do with our particular I was going to say attitude, but I don't. <laughs> our way of receiving that sort of how we view people around us that um, that we might the people that are closer to you you're going to receive that a whole lot different. I know. From it. an exception. Yeah. Well, it's relationship that God commands us to right. have a close relationship with your brother. And in my congregation, I. They already know without my sharing that maybe I'm going through a struggle or having a, a conflict going on that I'm not yet ready to tell them. But it's very comforting for them to say, I've already seen it. That's I'm different. There. Our congregation like is like 60% Gilberts, okay? <laughs> that's, that's our family. Of course they're going to know something wrong. When Lisa or Janice or one of them lady, fine ladies come up and go, Seen it. I'm there for you. Yeah. That's what we're learning from this. Is better right. to have that close connection. Good. Yeah, and, and and we do we we do become more that way as we get to know one another, and that's part of what he's already already talked about in his commendation for them. Um, uh, he he talks in there about the love that they have for each other. And, uh, and they are evidently able to receive something like that from Paul. Uh, yeah, we're all going to receive, some, receive those things differently because of our mentality, maybe how we've been treated in the past. And yeah, we know the flip side, that there are people out there that that's just lip service. I prayed for you. Well, yeah, there are people out there that, and, and very often we know them. So, I, I, but, but I think going back to the, what we were originally talking about, the commendation and his prayers for them would have been something that they would have received and, and would have softened their hearts. This guy is an apostle, and he's thinking about us and praying about us in the situation that we ha we're having. Rich.
Good. Just to kind of add on to that, when I think of this, I think about intentional prayer. You know, like he had a mission, he had an intention, and I think sometimes it gets watered down because we're not intentionally saying, I'm going to pray for this, I'm going to do this. And then I will say just really quick that I've been other places, you know, other churches where you're talking to someone and then and right there they know that you're struggling and they'll take you and they'll say, let's pray right now. You know what I mean? So if you know a brother or sister that doesn't believe that you care or, you know, whatever that issue is with them, okay, let's do it right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that wipes out a lot of that, but it's that intentional, I'm praying for you right now for this and actually do it. Okay, good, good. Yeah, thank you. Right there. Okay, so that was kind of a quick beginning of uh, Colossians. Uh, we'll, uh, next week we will next week we'll we'll go through the next three chapters fairly quickly. Uh, I hope that you notice as you read this this past week that that what we've read up through chapter two is Jesus Christ and who He is and His supremacy and and everything is wrapped up in Him. And, uh, and we'll talk some about that next week, but, but that's the basis for everything that comes with that, with our behavior. Uh, how do we respond to the love that, that uh, uh, was given to us by God, by Jesus Christ and the sacrifice? So let's pray and then we'll be done for this morning. Our Father, we come to you again and, uh, and, and we do love you. Uh, we do thank you uh, for blessing us. Uh, Father, uh, be with us as we re read through the rest of Colossians this week that, uh, that uh, things would uh, touch our hearts, that, that we would increase in our, in our, our knowledge of this particular letter and uh, help us to find things that will help us to uh, have a better standing in you to, uh, to be stronger as, as Christians, as your faithful servants. In Jesus' name, amen.